if I could uh, have your attention. My name is Justin Shubo. I'm president of the National Civic Art Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for, to hear Calder Loth speak on the topic of reconstructing lost architecture, a commendable tradition. Founded in 2002, the National Civic Art Society educates and empowers leaders in the promotion of public art and architecture worthy of our great republic. We do so by advocating for the classical tradition in civic design. We believe that that tradition is unparalleled in its beauty, dignity, and harmony, not to mention its legi legibility to the common man. It's no accident that the founding fathers consciously chose the classical st style when the designing the nation's capital and its core buildings of government. The founders sought to hearten back to Republican Rome and Democratic Athens, and they knew that classical architecture was time-honored and timeless. The National, Civic Arts, Art, sorry, the National Civic Arts Society works to continue and expand upon the founders' vision, um, but we are also now operating in New York City, where we are leading a bold project to rebuild the original Penn Station. Designed by McKim, Mead, and White, and opened, opening in uh, 1910, the original station was a Beaux-Arts masterpiece that equaled the majesty of Grand Central Terminal. In 1963, it was torn down and replaced with the current station, which if you've been there, I think you would agree is the most hated train station in America. <coughs> it is our goal to resurrect the original station to its original glory, as bold as that might be. The great urban planner Daniel Burnham said, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. It's our hope that the talk you're about to hear will provide some philosophical justifications for rebuilding monuments such as Penn Station. Our speaker tonight is Calder Loth. He is the senior architectural historian for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, where he was employed for 40 years and still serves part-time. He also serves as co-president for the Center of Palladian Studies in America, and he is a member of the Virginia Art and Architectural Review Board. His publications include the Virginia Landmarks Register, Virginia Landmarks of Black History, and Lost Virginia, Vanished Architecture of the Old Dominion. In 2008, he was the first recipient of the Secretary of the Interior's Preservation Award for service to state preservation programs. He has also received the Board of Directors Honors Award from the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. Please, jo please join me in welcoming Calder Loth. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to talk about a subject that I find both intriguing and pertinent. And I hope you will and at least uh, provide momentary distraction from the election. <laughs> but first, I need to say how much I admire the dedication and tenacity of the National Civic Arts Society. Keep up your important work. All right, reconstructions. What could be a more positive gesture for civic art than the recreation of beloved lost landmarks? But as we know, the reconstruction of destroyed historic and architectural landmarks has long been considered as something less than serious architectural expression. The loss of a landmark is usually taken to be an opportunity to rebuild with a contemporary aesthetic. And most architectural pundits maintain that new buildings should look to the future, not the past. Even so, uh, many people sincerely hold that natural or man-made tragedies should not deprive us of important heritage and that accurate rebuilding of noteworthy landmarks is a legitimate and commendable activity. Reconstructions serve emotional, patriotic, aesthetic, cultural, and educational needs. And the majority of scholarly reproductions both here and abroad are serious achievements. And time has shown that few people regret our resurrected landmarks. And it's always encouraging if you can cite biblical authority for your activity. <laughs> but first, I need to define the type of reconstructions I'll be talking about. I will not be talking about anastylosis, which is a scholarly archaeological term for gathering fragments of a destroyed 
ancient monument and incorporating them into an academically researched recreation of its original form, using new identical material to fill in the missing pieces. The few surviving elements of the treasury at Delphi enabled scholars to determine the building's original appearance and thus rebuild it. The light marble shown here is all new. This is anastylosis. And with great restraint, I will not be talking about a reconstruction with which I've been involved for many years, <laughs> Minokin, which we are defining as a high-tech anastylosis, a 21st century approach to reconstructing a ruin, replacing missing sections with glass to help interpret the house's long history of neglect and collapse. But Minokin is the subject of another time. Nor will I be talking about reconstructing within a gutted shell. St. Bride's Fleet Street was one of the many City of London churches burnt out in the Blitz. Its walls survived. The interior was reconstructed within the original walls. Now, many great buildings such as Pavlovsk and Peterhof palaces in Russia have been rebuilt within their gutted shells, but these are another subject too. Instead, uh, what I wish to share with you this evening is a selection of reconstructions of totally or nearly totally destroyed historic buildings, destroyed either by fire, natural disaster, or conscious demolition. And I'm showing a fraction of a voluminous body of such undertakings, but we'll peruse this sampling and see how these efforts have maintained cultural identity and have truly enriched society. And with these, I want to hammer home the point that reconstruction is a legitimate activity. And actually, my horoscope this morning read, speak up and share your thoughts in order to start a dialogue that will raise important issues. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Many people are not even aware that some of the buildings we'll be looking at are reconstructions, and few wish they hadn't happened. And, and even if they were aware that they were reconstructions. Okay, let's start with our own country, with one of our earliest reconstructions, the Jamestown, Virginia Church. By the early 20th century, all that was left was the church's ruined tower. As part of Jamestown's 1907 tercentenary celebration, it was decided to rebuild the long lost body of the church. This view shows the temporary shed protecting the site's archeological investigations. The completed church followed the archeological footprint. But what did the original church really look like? They had little idea. So the architect relied on precedent. Fair enough. An old St. Luke's church near Smithfield, Virginia, also built in the late 17th century, provided credible precedent, adequate support for a justifiable conjectural reconstruction. Interestingly, the rebuilt Jamestown church was designed by the Boston architect Edmund Wheelwright better known as the architect of the Harvard Lampoon Building, a work with some similar qualities. Okay, next, Dartmouth Hall, the signature building of Dartmouth College, built 1787 to 91. The stately wood frame structure contained dormitories, classrooms, museum, and library, all the eggs in one basket, a risky situation. In 1904, faulty wiring started a blaze that reduced the building to smoldering embers in just two hours. The decision to replicate the lost work was made while the fire was still hot. And being practical minded about replacing a utilitarian building, it was decided to rebuild with steel frame and brick rather than wood. So we have a visual facsimile rather than an exact reproduction. But the New England ambiance of this venerable institution is maintained. The building continues as Dartmouth's signature image. 
The 1817 First Congregational Church in Old Lamb, Connecticut was the very form of the New England Meeting House, complete with a Gibbs-style steeple. Its storybook beauty inspired numerous works of art, such as this child Hassan painting. The church was completely destroyed in 1907 by a never-caught arsonist. The congregation and the community wanted their church back, not some new expression. And the paintings proved to be important documentation for a reconstruction. Now, like Dartmouth Hall, steel frame and masonry were used, but the church's surfaces employed wood like the original, resulting in an amazingly beautiful recreation. And the church continues as an active, character-defining landmark for its historic community. The restoration of Colonial Williamsburg was perhaps the nation's most ambitious preservation project. <clears throat> Although some 80 original buildings survived, several significant lost buildings had to be reconstructed in order to complete the plan and tell the story. A strategic lost building was the Governor's Palace, burned in 1781 while being used as a military hospital. The 18th century Frenchman's map seen here gave a key to its outline and sighting. And Thomas Jefferson's measured floor plan provided dimensions and shapes of the rooms. Thank goodness. Jefferson's plan was confirmed by archeological investigations. But what did the church really look like? Oh, just tell him I'm busy if you would. <laughs> Thank you. We have a footprint, but if you find my footprint in the sand, could you cre recreate a person that looked like me from that footprint? Hope not. Even so, conjectural designs for the palace's appearance pushed forth based on area precedence. It probably would have looked like a big Westover. Fortunately, in the nick of time, a researcher found an 18th century copper engraving plate in Oxford's Bodleian Library, the famous Bodleian plate, showing the Capitol, the College of William and Mary, and the Governor's Palace, seen in the lower right. The palace's image is seen here. The researcher promptly contacted Williamsburg. Stop, hold off, I found something. And this wholly reliable image gave sufficient evidence for an accurate reconstruction of the palace exterior. The rebuilt palace, now nearly 90 years old, has been an educational venue for millions of visitors and will continue to be. Now, colonial America had one other palace, that ordered by William Tryon, the Royal Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, for the coastal town of Newburn. Luckily, the palace's original architectural drawings by British architect John Hawkes survived, seen here. Trine's palace was completed in 1770. Its design closely followed one published by James Gibbs. Revolutionaries took over the palace in 1775 and used it for their non-royal seat of government. Fire destroyed Trine's palace in 1798, but one dependency survived into the 20th century. Well, the North Carolinians were not to be outdone by the Virginians. So in the 1950s, a group of wealthy patrons organized to have the palace reconstructed, handsomely so. So we have a recreation of what was probably the largest and finest house built in colonial America. And it takes guts for a Virginian to admit that. <laughs> it's now, anyway, a highly popular museum. Now, one of America's most historic houses, ah, oh, here we have. One of America's most historic houses was this simple Greek revival dwelling, the home of Wilmer McLean. McLean originally lived in a farm near Manassas, Virginia which in 1861 became the battlefield for the first Battle of Manassas, or Bull Run. Following the battle, 
McLean said, I'm out of here, no more battles. So he bought this house in the remote village of Appomattox, a village that didn't even have good maps to find it. So supposedly it was safe from military harm. The rest, of course, is history. War found its way to Appomattox. On April the 9th, 1865, General Lee surrendered to General Grant in Wilmer McLean's parlor, thus effectively ending the Civil War. The scene was accurately depicted in this 1868 painting. The war left McLean broke. The house was auctioned in 1869. It went through a couple of owners, and in 1891, it was purchased by a pair of entrepreneurs. They planned to dismantle the house and rebuild it as a historic attraction in either Chicago or Washington. The house was thus dismantled but the money immediately dried up. Its materials were left stacked on the site and were pilfered over the years by souvenir hunters. Nothing left. The National Park Service acquired the nearly deserted, nearly deserted village of Appomattox in the 1930s with the intention of reconstructing both the courthouse and the McLean House for its new historic park. Fortunately, the entrepreneurs had made architectural drawings of the house for their intended rebuilding. They were vital for the Park Service's reconstruction completed in 1949. And the painting shown earlier became the guide for the parlor, incorporating copies of the original furniture now preserved in the Smithsonian. For the past 68 years, the reconstructed house has been a telling monument for the place where our nation was reunited. An intriguing but little known reconstruction is that of St. Michael's Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Sitka, Alaska. Sitka served as the capital of Russia, America from 1808 to 1867, and then became the capital of the US territory of Alaska. The cathedral completed in 1849 was the spiritual center of Alaska's Russian Orthodox community. They're still there. Its architecture was traditional Russian style with onion domes and bell tower. Alas, fire completely consumed St. Michael's on January the 2nd, 1966. Thankfully, the Historic American Building Survey had carefully documented the building with measured drawings and photographs in 1961. This made an accurate replication feasible. The rebuilding was completed in 1976, but with a steel frame structural system rather than the log core of the original. Even so, the architectural and historic importance of the cathedral, even as a reconstruction, allowed it to retain its national historic landmark status. An equally exotic religious edifice was the Mormon Temple of Nauvoo, Illinois, on a promontory overlooking the Mississippi River. It was completed in 1846, but within months, anti-Mormon prejudice forced its members to flee the town. An arsonist set fire to the abandoned temple in 1848. The ruins were pulled down in 1865. Mormons reacquired the site in 1937 with the hope of eventually rebuilding their lost temple. Construction finally commenced in 2000 and was completed two years later. Although built with steel frame, the same marble as the original was used for its walls. This arresting edifice demonstrates the Mormons' creative use of the classical vocabulary. And as we know from the modern temple on the Capitol Beltway, Mormons have never shied from erecting visually arresting temples. <laughs> and now a private reconstruction, Greenwood in Louisiana. Few dwellings were as evocative of the Old South as Greenwood the 1830s mansion of William Ruffin Barrow, the seat of a 12,000 acre plantation worked by 750 slaves. 
It was set off by a peripheral colonnade of 28 Doric pillars. Union troops looted the property, but spared the house by using it as a hospital. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Percy purchased Greenwood in 1915 and repaired the house. On August the 1st, 1960, lightning torched Greenwood and completely destroyed all but the columns. In 1968, Walton Barnes acquired the ruin with 300 acres. Using photographs and descriptions, he and his son carefully reconstructed Greenwood, finishing it in 1984. It's now open to the public and accommodates overnight guests and has served as a location for motion pictures. This kind of private undertaking took love and guts, and we can be grateful for the rebirth of this distinctive American icon. Undoubtedly, the most extensive reconstruction project in North America has been the rebuilding of Louisburg on the northern tip of Nova Scotia. Louisburg was the fortress town established by the French to protect the entrance to the St. Lawrence River and the fr French fishing in in interests. As part of their effort to conquer French Canada, the British captured Louisburg in 1758. Prime Minister William Pitt then ordered the complete leveling of the town and its fortifications, reducing it to an archaeological site. Two centuries later, to honor its French cultural heritage, the Canadian government undertook the reconstruction of Louisburg. The rebuilding by Parks Canada begun in 1963 and extended over the next 20 years has been remarkable. Some 80 buildings and nearly a mile of fortifications have been reconstructed, aided by original architectural drawings surviving in French archives. It has spawned a whole generation of specialized craftsmen. And the King's Bastion Barracks is Louisbourg's anchoring landmark, a monument of French military design. We now cross the Atlantic for some inspiring and surprising examples. Venice, Venice's St. Mark's Campanile is a powerful focal point for one of the world's most famous public spaces, seen here in a painting by Canaletto. Its construction started in the 9th century and continued into the 11th century. Repairs to earthquake damage undertaken in 1511 to 14 resulted in the 300-foot structure receiving its definitive profile. Fire damage in successive years caused cracks to appear in the sides, leading to structural weakness. Finally, at 9.45 in the morning of July 14, 1902, oh my God, no, the entire building collapsed into a pile of bricks. Oh, sh bad words. The Venetian Communal Council wasted no time in voting to rebuild the Campanile exactly as it was. The new Campanile, one of the world's most familiar landmarks, was officially completed on August 25th, 1912, St. Mark's Day. Few of the millions of visitors to Venice realize the structure is barely 100 years old, and we can't imagine Venice without it. Now, we don't necessarily associate destruction of great buildings with World War I. The conflict was mostly mired in trench warfare. But we did have a major casualty, Belgium's famous cloth hall at Ypres. This astonishing 13th century Gothic pile, the nerve center of the town's thriving cloth industry, was one of the largest medieval commercial buildings in Europe. German bombardment damaged the hull on November 23, 1914, and incendiary devices torched it the following day. The German artillery piece Big Bertha inflicted further damage in 1915, and what was left was reduced to this, 
in 1918. Following the war, British decreed that the remaining wreck should be left as a memorial. However, local sentiment for recreating the beloved lost landmark led to a meticulous reconstruction lasting from 1933 to 1967. Today, much of this stunning building houses a museum in interpreting World War I. The cloth hall truly embodies the notion that reconstructions are the captive beauty of a lost past. I now want to turn to what was considered a somewhat controversial reconstruction, the Stoa of Attalos in the Athens Agora. We're looking at a computer rendering of what it may have looked like. The Stoa was one of Athens' principal Hellenistic civic works built around 140 BC, housing many shop stalls. Its 377 foot facade was fronted by a two tier colonnade an important gathering place. Barbarian invaders destroyed the Stoa in 267 AD. Archaeological investigations of its site began in 1862. The American School of Classical Studies conducted more intense study and excavations in the 1930s. The school's research, coupled with the archaeological remains, provided sufficient evidence to justify a plausible reconstruction. The Rockefeller Foundation funded the Stoa's rebuilding of 1952 to 56. Even so, the project was, was criticized for being in contravention to accepted codes of restoration. Indeed, the subsequent Venice Charter of 1964 specifically discourages such reconstruction particularly when it imposes on delicate archaeological districts. Instead, very limited anastylosis, such as currently being undertaken on the Parthenon, is grudgingly accepted. Be that as it may, the imposing reconstruction has served as a demonstration of the appearance and function of an ancient stoa. The building now houses the Museum of the Agora. And now, World War II. It would be impossible to calculate the full extent of loss of architectural heritage, much less of humanity, caused by World War II. Nevertheless, reconstructions have attempted to assuage some of this loss. We'll look at a handful of notable examples. First the famed Abbey of Monte Cassino, begun in 529 by St. Benedict of Nursia, founder of the Benedictine order. The Abbey is the order's official home. The complex was largely rebuilt in the 11th century with exceptional splendor. During the 1944 Allied invasion of Italy, it was believed that Nazi troops were using the Abbey as an observation post. This threatened the Allied advance on Rome. Thus, the order was given to bomb it. The Abbey was obliterated on February 15, 1944. Tragically, it was subsequently learned that the Nazis were not entrenched there after all, and that the casualties were local citizens seeking refuge. The monks immediately did resolved to rebuild. Architects, as we might expect, proposed a modern style complex. The monks rebuffed them, saying they were ignoring the site's history. So from 1948 to 56, the abbey was carefully replicated, incorporating fragments of original material in each of the cloisters. Nitpickers criticized the project for going against contemporary preservation theory. But most saw it as a symbol of recovery for war-torn Italy. The monks maintain that the rebuilding looked backward in order to look forward. 
and the Abbey Chapel was restored with all its original magnificence. If this can be done, anything can be done. Well, uh, it's difficult to summarize or even describe the destruction of Warsaw, particularly that of the Old Town Market Square, the historic heart of the Polish capital. The square dates from the 13th century. It was largely rebuilt in Renaissance and Baroque styles following a fire in 1607. Luftwaffe raids damaged the square in 1939. But massive destruction came later, following the Nazi suppression of Polish resistance, the famous Polish uprising that lasted from August to October of 1944. As punishment for the uprising, <clears throat> the Nazis expelled the city's entire citizen population and then systematically destroyed 90% of Warsaw's buildings, making heavy use of flamethrowers, building by building. The market square was all but ruined. After the war, instead of a modern quick fix, the Poles rallied to recreate their much-loved square exactly as it was. The rebuilding lasted from 1948 to 53. The square's reconstruction was just part of the rebuilding of the rest of historic Warsaw, the largest reconstruction project in history. It was a refutation of architects' push to remake the city into a Corbusian-type Futurama. Warsaw's citizens declared, without tradition, there can be no future. The reconstructed historic center of Warsaw has since been placed on the World Heritage List. And the following is quoted from UNESCO's official statement. Quote, the historic center of Warsaw is an exceptional example of the comprehensive reconstruction of a city that had been deliberately and totally destroyed. The foundation of the material reconstruction was the inner strength and determination of the nation, which brought about the reconstruction of the heritage on a unique scale in the history of the world." Unquote. Another victim of wanton Nazi destruction was Florence's elegant Ponte Santa Trinita, designed by Bartolomeo Emanati and completed in 1569. It's speculated that Michelangelo had a hand in the design, or certainly influenced it. The bridge's complex elliptical <laughs> arches echo the curves in Michelangelo's Medici tombs. On August 3 and 4 of 1944, in order to halt the British Eighth Army, the retreating Nazis dynamited the bridge. It took three tries to do the job. And the Nazis also destroyed <clears throat> all of Florence's other bridges, save for the Ponte Vecchio, which Hitler admired. How thoughtful of him. As part of the reconstruction, as many fragments as possible were fished from the river and reused. Stone from the original quarry was employed for the major fabrication. The bridge reopened in 1958, and we can't picture Florence without it. Now, regrettably, the Allies, too, were hardly respectful of Europe's architectural heritage. Major German cities were relentlessly devastated by Allied carpet bombing in an effort to destroy German morale and to encourage surrender. Hildesheim in Lower Saxony was a treasure of late medieval buildings. Outstanding was the 1529 Nockenhauer Amsthaus, or Butcher's Guildhall. Now, notice the fountain in the square. The same scene followed following Allied bombing in 1945. After the war, 
the city needed to reestablish its wrecked economy. So a modern hotel was built on the site in 1964. As you might imagine, it was not a popular destination hotel. Citizens thus rose to the occasion and said, we want our guild hall back. The bankrupt hotel was demolished and the Amsthaus was completely reconstructed as only the Germans can do, a triumph of traditional craftsmanship completed in 1989. And the old fountain looks on approvingly. Another target of Allied bombing was Brunswick or Brunswick. Carpet bombing devastated the city on October 15, 1944. A victim was the 1841 palace, the former seat of the Dukes of Brunswick. The palace was left a gutted shell. Some discussion about restoration occurred, but the city government lacked sufficient money at the time, so it voted to clear the ruins and create a park. The walls came down in 1960. Subsequent West German prosperity made the park attractive for commercial development, so it was decided to build a shopping mall on the site. This generated sentiment for reconstructing the palace instead. A compromise was reached. Do both. So we have the palace coupled to a shopping mall. Why not? The palace was handsomely rebuilt, incorporating a number of original fragments. It houses a museum complete with throne room. The mall is a mall. <laughs> a nice one. A win-win situation. And now Dresden. The bombing of Dresden ranks with the most controversial of the war's allied actions. Justification for the utter destruction of one of Europe's most culturally important but far from militarily strategic cities is still debated. A tragic architectural casualty of the carpet bombings and resulting firestorm of February 1945 was the Frauenkirche, Dresden's majestic Lutheran church. This voluptuous domed edifice was a masterpiece of Baroque architecture. The bombing raids reduced the church to a pile of stones. Despite sentiment for its rebuilding, the East German government declared reconstruction low priority, so it kept the rubble as a war memorial, concentrating instead on reconstructing the Zwinger Palace. Following German reunification, a citizens' action group formed to pressure for rebuilding. With local government support, the reconstruction began in 1993 and was completed in 2006. Some 3,800 original stones were reused. Their blackened surfaces were left as witnesses to the church's destruction and resurrection. And the magnificent interior was le replicated to the last detail, an astonishing space. Dresden was a bad enough loss, but Berlin remained the primary target for obvious reasons. Nazism had to be destroyed, but war took with it much of Berlin's architecture. Among the losses was the Commandanten House, which had the prestigious address of number one Unter den Linden. Its core dated from 1653 and was expanded in the 18th century, becoming the seat of the commander of the Berlin garrison. It received its Renaissance-style facade in an 1873 remodeling. Allied bombing left only sections of the palace's walls intact. The East German government demolished the ruins in the 1950s in order to build on its site the modernist Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This unloved building was pulled down following German reunification. 
A media corporation then acquired the site to build its Berlin offices. The Berlin Senate required replication of the facade, although the interior could be wholly modern since little documentation for it survived. The facade was duly reconstructed in 2003. Critics panned the project as Disneyfication, but the building serves as a focal point in the most historic and beautiful quarter of the city. What else could you or should you do there? And now a reconstruction in progress. The Berlin Stadtschloss, or Royal Palace, the sprawling, much evolved structure was the seat of the kings of Prussia and the emperors of Germany. It was seriously damaged in the war. Even so, its walls remained intact, as did some of the interiors. Restoration was not out of the question, but the communist East German government considered the palace a monument to imperialism. Bad, bad. So, in 1950, Walter Ulbricht ordered it all destroyed, using nine tons of dynamite to do the job. In 1976, the East German Palace of the Republic was built on the site. This triumph of socialist modernism, which could easily be mistaken for an insecticide factory, <laughs> was later pulled down because it was found to be contaminated with asbestos. It came down in 2003, following German reunification. The federal government approved its demolition. A hot debate over the site's use ensued. Finally, champions for reconstructing the palace won the day. And in 2007, the German federal government voted to rebuild it. Foes said it violated the Venice Charter, but they didn't have a better idea. I took this photo in 2008 as the last of the communist building was coming down. The domed Berlin Cathedral is in the background. Reconstruction began in 2012, and occupancy is scheduled for next year. We see a progress photo, and this is a computer rendering of what the palace will look like when done. It's almost there. The interior will be multi-purpose, housing museums, theater, auditorium, and restaurants. Portions of the interior will be reconfigured so that someday some of the staterooms can be reinstalled, restalled, reinstalled over time. So perhaps someday we can see Schlutter's famous Rittersaal recreated. And now, Russia. Many losses of Russian architecture were self-inflicted. I'll show two conspicuous examples. First is the Iberian Gate, which marked the northern entrance to Moscow's Red Square. And the name has nothing to do with Spain. It derives from Iversky, connoting the Ivran Monastery on Mount Athos in Greece, which houses a miracle-working icon. The gate dated from 1583. A small chapel displaying a replica of the famous icon was affixed between the arches in 1669. Here, all visitors to Moscow, including the Tsar, prayed on entering the city. The Soviets demolished the gate in 1931 to provide access to Red Square for large military pieces displayed in communist celebrations. The arrows mark the gate's former location. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Moscow city government authorized reconstruction of the gate, an undertaking sanctioned by the Russian Orthodox Church. The project was completed in 1994 an old wrong made right. Not far away was the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. This behemoth, the largest church ever built in Russia, was a monument to the Russian victory over Napoleon. 
Designed in traditional Russian style, but Constantine toned, the cornerstone was laid in 1839. The cathedral was finally consecrated in 1883. The world premiere of the 1812 overture was planned to be performed in the cathedral in 1882, but the building was not quite finished, so the performance was held in a tent out front. Now, in the 1920s, the Soviets' espousal of atheism deemed the cathedral, along with many other churches, to be unnecessary luxuries. On top of that, Stalin wanted the site for his proposed Palace of the Soviets, a glorification of communism. Sure enough. So, the cathedral was dynamited on December 5th 1931. Construction of the Palace of the Soviets actually started but was halted during the war. The steel frame was taken down for the war effort. Lack of funds following the war inhibited any further work. So a big swimming pool complex was built on the site. Here old babushkas would take their grandchildren swimming and secretly baptized them here <laughs> because they considered the site to be holy. Amazingly, in 1990, the Soviet government authorized the Russian Orthodox Church to reconstruct the cathedral, one of the Soviet's last acts. Soviet Union collapsed the next year. Reconstruction largely funded by a million private donations, began in 1994 and was completed in 2000. It's hard to believe the scale of this building, especially when you see the interior. If this can be reconstructed, anything can be reconstructed, and this was done in only six years. Don't underestimate the value of reconstructions or the ability to accomplish them. I want to conclude with a brief look at three potential candidates for reconstruction, although the list could be much, much longer. Two are personal choices. The third is an obvious one. The first is close to home, Thomas Jefferson's 1826 anatomical theater at the University of, of Virginia. We have Jefferson's architectural drawings for it. Unbelievably, this unique Jefferson building was demolished in 1939 because it interfered with the view of the new Alderman Library behind it. A wealthy alumnus pushed for its reconstruction around 30 years ago, but the local architectural establishment waived the Venice Charter. The Charter declares, quote, all reconstruction work should, however, be ruled out a priori. Only anastylosis can be permitted." Unquote. Maybe someday we can have Jefferson's building back. It would be a fascinating undertaking. And now a more ambitious candidate, the Tuileries Palace. This was the official Paris residence of the kings of France and later of Napoleon I and Napoleon III. Dating from 1549, the palace was originally designed by Philibert de Lorme. It later was joined to the Louvre by Henry IV's Grand Gallery and ultimately connected the two outstretched arms of the Louvre. During the Paris Commune of 1871, anti-royalist factions set fire to the palace and dynamited its dome. After burning for 48 hours, only the gutted shell remained. Sentiment for rebuilding got nowhere. Finally, in 1883, the ruins were demolished and their materials sold. Interestingly, serious talk of reconstructing the palace started in 2003, but further action remains stalled. The palace is excellently documented. Accurate replication inside and out is possible. But more importantly, 
the Louvre Museum needs additional space, and reconstruction would have the great benefit of permitting a continuous circulation pattern. The two arms of the Louvre are now just dead ends. And finally, Penn Station. It would be gross understatement to say that the demolition of Penn Station was about the dumbest thing this country ever did. It was a decision made by people not fully evolved. <laughs> One cannot speak of McKim, Mead, and White's Penn Station without lapsing into a plethora of superlatives. I had the privilege of experiencing Penn Station. I can never forget it. America at the turn of the last century considered itself a new Rome, an empire for liberty, and adopted the Roman architectural image for its own, and did it really well. Can you imagine that we went from this to this? New York at its most vapid. That's not strong enough. It's really trashy. The concourse that was and now is, it's the same footprint, but about as inviting as the vortex of hell. <laughs> and to rub it in, it has this lugubrious bit of artwork commemorating our vandalism. Vandals destroy what they can't understand. <clears throat> Plans for upgrading Penn Station are currently in the works. Plans about as inspiring as a Walmart. But thanks to Richard Cameron, Catesby Lee, and others, a convincing case for reconstructing McKim, Mead, and White's Penn Station is being put forth. The design can be adapted to meet modern needs. And you will hear all about this in your upcoming lecture. And as I hope I have shown with the examples we have seen, such an undertaking would be hardly unique. Well, of course, reconstructions are not the real thing. But those we have seen this evening and many, many others are not worthless fakes. They are serious efforts to return to us designs of great meaning and beauty. They help historic places retain their sense of identity, identity that has been seriously wounded. Mostar in Bosnia would be irrelevant without its bridge. And we should note that its reconstruction, following being blown up as part of the ethnic cleansing of Bosnia, the reconstruction seen here has kept the bridge's World Heritage Site status officially symbolizing the legitimacy of a careful and loving replication. The UNESCO report on the Mostar Bridge reconstruction stated, quote, the authenticity of form, use of authentic materials and techniques are fully recognizable. The reconstruction of the fabric of the bridge should be seen as the background to the restoration of the intangible dimensions of this property. Yeah. We began this program with Isaiah's prophetic statement, and we should close with it, remembering that reconstruction can be the right thing to do. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions from the audience, and if you could please wait, there is a microphone um, that will pass around. But if I could just first ask one question, could you explain the thought behind the architectural and preservation establishment that finds these reconstructions completely anathema, calling them fraudulent and inauthentic, and what is your response to that? standard. The authenticity has been lost. It can't be recreated. We should look to the future, not to the past. 
Can we do better? Good question. Any, any questions? Comments? Comments. Or let me know what your candidate for Reconstruction is. I'm sure you all have one. What's here in Washington that would be a good candidate for Reconstruction? Hi. Uh, I just wanted to know, because we talked about kind of through time, particularly with wars, um, and if there is an effort to at least look to preserving or to start recording a lot of the artifacts um, and order architecture that we're seeing in the Middle East right now being destroyed by both war and Islamic State, et cetera. From what I read in the papers, it's being done dangerously and with desperation by people. And as you saw, what was it, the chief curator for, for uh, was it Syria, was murdered? by ISIS, it had his head cut off because he was trying to, Palmyra, Palmyra I'm sorry, uh, was trying to um, preserve um, Palmyra from being destroyed and looted. Yeah, uh, what, was the, what was the one totally destroyed recently by ISIS um, the, in, in northern? Palmyra? No. Um, uh, one of, the, one of these ancient temples, it'll come to me. Anyway, yeah, I, I, will some of those uh, victims be put back together? I don't know. I, we've got a long ways to go before we can even start thinking about how to treat those, the damage there. Yes, you have a question over there. Alley behind you, on the front row. All right. What kind of steps can be taken to lead to the re revocation of the Venice Charter? Uh, get your friend the ICOMOS um, board to consider it. I don't know, as, we, as I read from um, the, some of these ICOMOS statements, they are um, um, sanctioning reconstruction, as they did with the Mostar Bridge, as they did with Warsaw. Uh, that's going in contravention to, to the um, Venice Charter, but it's being done anyway, and it's being lauded. So I don't know. Um, who's enforcing the Venice Charter? Do you have to obey them? Are they going to haul you off to jail if you reconstruct something? I don't know. Question on the front row. David Talbot from the National Civic Art Society. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I'm wondering if there are any examples of reconstructions gone awry uh, that, uh, you know, if we're thinking about these important reconstruction projects you just made, uh, some really excellent cases for it. I'm curious to know if there are some uh, lessons we can learn about, about why reconstructions fail. Well, I can name one in my own backyard. Um, some years ago, maybe 30-some years ago, a group tried to reconstruct Shadwell, uh, where Thomas Jefferson was born. They thought they had the original plan by Thomas Jefferson for Shadwell. Anyway, they opened it to the public. You've heard the poem, Smarty Smarty Gave a Party and Nobody Came. Nobody came. I mean, it was just a simple house. It wasn't much to see. You got Monticello right up on the mountain. Well, why go to see Chadwell? And they since found out that uh, that plan that Jefferson did was very questionably, very questionable as, as Chadwell. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, the museum closed down. The building wasn't very big, and actually, I think they picked it up on a helicopter and flew it over to the Boar's Head Inn, and now it's a real estate office or something there. So if you really want to see it, um, a reconstruction gone awry, you can go to the Boar's Head Inn and see it there. That is a very conspicuous example. Uh, trying to think of others. It hasn't gone awry, but... Um, the reconstruction of the colonial capital in Williamsburg, the researchers have found out that there are a lot of things that were not built exactly as, as they found it that they should have been. They're not going to change it as far as I know. It'd be that you'd have to rebuild the thing to do so, but they're being perfectly honest about um, new evidence has shed light on, on what it should have been. 
Um, I question the design of the uh, ballroom of the governor's palace. We have no idea what they look like. They use, I think, the doorways from Rosewell as precedent for that. It's a complete uh, conjecture. And I don't know whether further study would offer better evidence for what that wing looked like. I don't know. And of course, the interiors of the governor's palace are complete conjecture. And we have very little idea what they originally were like. Does the American Institute of Architects pay any attention to the things we've been talking about here tonight? Do they, say, do they recognize what's going on and have any take on it? Far be it for me to speak for the AIA. I'm, I'm not an architect uh, and not a member of the AIA. Um, I don't know. Certainly, architects have not turned down a good project. <laughs> and if one came to them, I, I would think they would entertain the idea. I don't know whether they would say just on principle they can't do it, or certainly most of the architects are trained to be modernists and they're just simply unqualified to do this kind of thing. Uh, there are plenty of skilled architects in traditional design that are perfectly capable of doing perfectly good reconstructions. Yes, back there. When a building has been remodeled several times, which iteration can be reconstructed or, or how can you go about determining it? Now, are you thinking about a building that's been completely destroyed but you know its evolution? Uh, well, that's certainly come up with the Berlin Royal Palace. Uh, and parts of the earliest section, as I understand it, and some of the inner courtyards are not being reconstructed. Uh, these are judgment calls. It's a practical matter. Um, on, yeah, on the Berlin Royal Palace, obviously they're having to accommodate the interior for all these new functions. Mainly they're doing the exterior because it is an important landmark in the, in the, um, in the appearance of the city. Um, so that, that's the priority. Um, and I don't know how many of those interiors will be replaced over time. It's a fascinating project. Um, I need to learn more about it. One, uh, one other or? One more. All right, I'm, we're holding you up for drinks, but well, one more question. Yes, sir. We saw in World War II the, um, the corruption of classical forms by the Nazis and the fascists. If and when similar authorities arise again that use reconstruction for such a validity again, is that something we should be wary of or should we embrace whatever silver lining we can? Say that again. I didn't quite understand the question. Um, when such corrupt authorities oh. eventually arise that seek to use reconstruction, to gain popularity, um, should we take that for the silver line that it, that it is architecturally, or should we fear such implications? Well, someone once said to me, architecture doesn't have morality. <laughs> Do you disdain a building because it's associated with bad people? I don't know. I mean, some of the worst people have rebuilt, have, have built some very interesting buildings, and. Uh, there's a lot of reconstruction and restoration going on in Russia right now. Do we look down our nose at them because we don't like Russia right, a whole lot right now? I don't, don't know. I'm, I'm kind of glad they're doing what they're doing. Some wonderful work going on there. Anybody want to make a counter statement to that? What do you feel? It, it would have been, say that, I didn't quite hear you. <coughs> it brings it to me that they are lying before destroying the Abbey of Monte Cassino would have checked if the Germans were there. Yes, we all wish they had. Uh, they were going on the best information they had at the time. They got permission from the head of the Abbey to bomb the building. Um, I guess they assumed that it was a, a, a strategic observation post and that the, um, and the war was, was more important. 
Yes, we're all very sorry that happened. It was a tragic mistake, but it was, it was done with the best of intentions. So I think we can continue this conversation uh, informally over drinks, all right? Okay. So